why that happened. And if you don't remember the story, they thought they were going to build a tower to reach heaven. God decided to stop that by <coughs> diversifying language. And all of a sudden, they didn't understand the words that the guy standing next to them were trying to say. And that resulted in people going in different directions. And it is true that if we don't understand people, it's hard for us to make any other kind of contact or connection with them. That's, that's part of what we're going to talk about today, just that as a premise. Also, once again, the adult Sunday school lesson was just a beautiful prep. So if you weren't here for that, poke the person next to you and say, what did they talk about Sunday school? And I hope they'll, they'll remember that we talked about choosing which direction our life is going to go. That's a lot of what we uh, discussed this morning. Okay, so let me make sure this thing is on and functional. Metering our lives. Okay, and I want you note to note first that that big ball on on the left there has a question mark on it. What's the biggest thing we're balancing? And that probably will have different answers depending on whose head we're looking into, right? And we see all these other things. And one thing I've noticed is kind of common among most people is they go, oh, I'm really busy. Or my family's really busy. And sometimes to the point where they think we're busy or even the new people, we're really busy. I know you think you're busy, but we're really busy. <coughs> and most people feel that they're really busy. And we're in a time of year right now where things get really busy, right? Because we have work that we can do because the weather allows it. Family gatherings, everybody wants to take advantage of sitting in the shade on a nice warm day. Uh, there's school reunions, family reunions, all kinds of things that happen this time of year. We have our church camp this year because we can go out there without freezing to death, right? All the things that come along that are trying to pull a section of our life. And let's see if I can get this thing to work here. So metering our busy life, right? What does it mean metering? Well, we, we meet out something and we have a meter maybe on our pump that shows how much water we're using, or we have a meter to show how much electricity is coming to the house. How do we adjust or decide how much time we apply to what? A little bit about the word metering. And yes, I'm going to be a bit of a word nerd to some of you today. Okay? And I know some of you don't like that, but remember the Tower of Babel. What happens if people don't know what the person next to them is saying? How important is it that we share understanding of words? A little bit about the word busy. It dates back to Old English, but it also has some connection for the word nerds amongst you to some of the Germanic languages, Dutch, in, in uh, to be specific, and they had the word besig, and I don't know that I'm even pronouncing that right, but in the oldest definitions that I could find in English, it actually leaned more towards a negative. It had the idea of being meddlesome or anxious. And you've heard of don't be a busybody? As we move closer to our time, the newer versions or newer definitions that I saw included these ideas. Occupied, busy means being occupied. Not in the sense that one nation goes over a border and occupies another nation, that's related, but to have your life full of things to do, you're fully occupied. And the idea of diligent. Being busy is being diligent towards what needs to be done. The newest I have found were, and I like this one, active at work. Okay, 
and full of activity. And that's the more correct ways to use the word busy in our modern society. I want to give you an example of how important words are for a moment. And I know you're going, metering lies, what's this have to do with it? Well, we have to understand what we're talking about in order to, to grasp what a Bible verse is saying, our neighbor is saying, what we're reading in a book. If we just read over a word we don't understand, what are we doing? We're setting ourselves up to use it incorrectly. And if you use it incorrectly with someone or to someone who knows the correct definitions, what are you doing? Are you going to persuade them if they know that you're using the word incorrectly? So I've kind of made it a goal of mine because I realized earlier on in my adult life, there are a lot of words I was using that I didn't know the correct definition to. And that maybe if I didn't want to appear to be a door, that I would learn how to use the word correctly. Sometimes look up the word door. <laughs> that might be interesting. There's lots of different definitions, by the way. I want to use the word location for a minute. And I'm going somewhere with this. <laughs> location. We talk about a location. Well, you have possibilities with that, right? That could be out in the middle of nowhere, in the wilderness. Or there could be a known address, 123 Any Street. Right. Which would you prefer? Well, it depends on what you're trying to do, right? What your message is. But usually it's helpful for us if someone can give an address. But if you're sending someone, if I tell you, I want you to go to 123 Any Street. You might go, well, wait a minute, what am I going to encounter there, right? And so I might tell you, well, it's a business address or it's a residence. And now we can find it a little more, haven't we? If it's a business, you might say, well, what kind of business? And it could be followed by, well, it's an office. Well, it's a shop. Well, it's a store. Well, it's a factory. Okay? And all of those words have their own meaning that help us define what a business would be. If I say it's an office, you might say, well, is it a regional office or is it the headquarters? Is it a big, lots of people working there or just one little hole in the wall office? Okay. If it's a shop, is it a dress shop? Or a machine shop. So how important are definitions and understanding these things? All right, now let's dive in. Another way of looking at this is the right mix, because we talk about metering our lives, right? And what the Bible has to say about that. And we can look at a recipe and all the ingredients that are involved. And how, how much does it help you in being a chef or a cook if you understand what each of those ingredients do? How that some of them form just the body of, of that food. Some of them are a bonding agent. Some of them are a, a, a leavening agent. Some of them are a spice to make the taste accented, right? Some of them are just like maybe water or fluids or salt, sugars, all these things have their own role in a recipe, right? And the more you understand that, the better you are at the occupation of being chef. But where we're, where we're applying this to metering our lives and all the different ingredients that can come into it, and we saw that little balancing act there, where we had the one big ball over here and all the little other little balls that you know might represent different things to each one of us. Okay. So this is the text that I kind of came to right off. 
And what I want to do with this, and I, we want to look at this verse, and then we're going to spread out slowly away from this verse in the context to see what we can gain from this. Right in the middle there, I have the, the King James Version, which is the version that most of us learn, right? And we would use this quite often to show people how they need to study the Bible, how they need to read the Bible. The question is, is that really what the text is saying, or is it saying something even broader? And we get a clue in some of the other translations. Notice in, in the New King James, it says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So what's the difference there between study to show thyself approved unto God? And what's the difference? I have the, the Christian study Bible down there in the bottom left. Be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved. A workman who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. And I notice there are a bunch of newer translations that use that phrase or very similar phrase, correctly teaching the word of truth. And Brent this morning in the, in the adult lesson brought up a point in a verse. And I, I, was, I was kind of listening, watching people's face to see how they reacted to what Brent did. Because he was saying, you know, I'm not trying to make a big point out of this, but sometimes we lose something when they change a word or replace it with a word that maybe has a broader meaning. And it may help us. But a valuable tool that we have and we should use because we have the tools. You know, it's one thing if you look at a time in history where people didn't have study tools and you think, well, to whom much is given, much will be required, right? If we have study tools, should we use them? Or should we just go, well, I don't need that. I don't need to have that much detail. And maybe you don't. Maybe you don't. But I'm here to suggest that maybe all of us could benefit from the tools that we have available to us. Because the closer we can look at the words we use to communicate, and to look at the words that others have chosen to use to communicate to us, the more we will get exactly what it is they were trying to say. And of course, the other side of that is, you go, yeah, he's being a word nerd. But the other side of it is, we also have to expand into the context and see what they're saying in what neighborhood. And you're going, well, how does this apply to me metering my life and deciding what I'm going to do, what I'm not going to do? I think it will become apparent. Word nerd moment. For the real word nerds, I gave the actual Greek word at the top, but the transliteration is there. You can read it. I don't even need to try to pronounce it for you, but notice how the, that word, the transliteration, is very similar to the word speed. There's a reason why, because if you, if you trace down the etymology, you will see the connection. The word that's translated in the King James, study, and most of the other ones, be diligent, has this connotation of speed, by, in, by implication, dispatch, eagerness, earnestness, business, or is that busyness? We usually pronounce it business. But it is busyness. It's being, what will you occupy? What is your occupation? What is your vocation? At what do you work? Okay? With earnest care or carefulness, diligence, forwardness, haste. And if you chase it back in Strong's to the root word, we come to that second word on the screen. to speed, study, so you can see where the King James got the idea. It has to urge on diligently or earnestly by implication to await eagerly, to make with haste or make haste or with haste unto. 
And so there's a teacher from our past here that defined it this way, diligence with a sense of urgency. Is that how we approach the word of God? Diligence with a sense of urgency. Otherwise, we think we have to be really careful. You know, there's a legal term, due diligence. Carefulness, but also it needs to get done. Moving to the immediate context. So what I'm going to do is go one verse before, one verse after. And some of you are going to see the first verse and go, yeah, shut up about words. Okay. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of the hearers. Okay. First thing I want you to note is the word strive. What does that mean? Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. How can you be diligent about rightly dividing the word of truth if you don't know the words? The easiest way to avoid strife about words is that if everyone knows them and agrees on their definition. That's how we can communicate clearly, is if we all know. But we don't all know. So some education is required. Okay? Now the but shun profane and idle babblings. We'll talk about those a little bit more in a minute. First, I want to talk about rightly dividing. And you notice some of the, if you remember, some of the other uh, translations say correctly teaching or preaching the word of God. But I want to look at the word that is translated in, from the Greek, from this word, orthotomeo, okay? Now you look at that and you go, well, there's some words maybe I can pick out of that that are, have come down into our English language. You ever gone to an orthopedic surgeon or to an orthopedic doctor? You know what ortho means. If you look at the definition, it says orthos and tomateros. Have you ever gone for tomography anywhere? Do you know what that is? At the clinic, I noticed on the door, it said computer assisted tomography, CAT, get a CAT scan, okay? But what does that mean? The word ortho, and it doesn't give it here, but it gives you the, the combined meaning to make a straight cut. Well, those are your clues. Ortho means straight. An orthopedic surgeon is one who considers him or concerns himself with straightening out straightening out the bones or the body that's what it means when you say what is orthodox straight doxo straight truth straight teachings so should we be careful when we use the word orthodox when we're talking about a church well they're orthodox really are they there are churches that claim we're the Orthodox Church, which they're saying we're the straight one. Everyone else is crooked. So now that you know that, how do you want to apply it? When you talk about another church, do you want to say they're an Orthodox Church? Are they really teaching the straight truth? Tomography really means and tome means in Greek and in Latin to slice down through. And that's basically what computer assisted tomography is doing is taking slice pictures and stacking them up so they can look through and see this image forming and get a picture all the way through. So to make a straight cut. So 
how do we how do we understand that then in this text where it says rightly dividing the word of truth are you making a straight cut right down between words and saying this one means this this one means this when we combine it we get this meaning so it is fair to say that that's correctly teaching the word of god but there's a broader understanding and understanding what we really said there to make a correct straight cut separating out what is right what is wrong real meaning from false meaning to have a clear understanding larger context zooming out so now first i'm going to go back up the top of the chapter and read down to this point you therefore my son be strong in the grace that is in christ jesus and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also now Remember, our, our topic is metering our lives, balancing act. What should we concern ourselves with? Paul is telling Timothy here, here's what you concern yourself with. You know what you've heard from me. You know the truths that you've been told. Commit these things to faithful men. Not just anybody, but faithful men who will be able, when he says commit, He's not saying teach. He's saying commit these things. Spend your time helping the people who are willing to help other people. Because we only have so much time. Who will be able to teach others also. You, therefore, Timothy, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The word therefore, I probably should have made that a different color. There's a connecting word again. So we have to understand that he's saying, you need to do this because of this. Because your primary goal should be taking these things that I've committed to you and committing to people who will in turn commit them to other faithful people and keep that process moving. So because of that, because that's your job, you should endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. I think everybody here understands if the neighbor comes knocking on your door and says, hey, the main system broke and there's water flowing all around our houses, that maybe you should get out and help them fix it. Sandbag, whatever needs to be done, you know? Or there's a fire in the neighborhood, maybe you should grab your shovel and go help them. We're not talking about the things that are obvious that we need to do amongst our neighbors and amongst our community. But it starts getting grayer and grayer the more we start moving into those things which would entangle us. Or the actual Greek word that's used here, I'm not going to give you that definition, I'm not going to go that word there. Means to entwine. get twisted up in, become just one more cord in the greater road. With the affairs of this life. Why? That he may please him who has listed him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Yeah. Whatever we choose to do, we have to obey the rules. We have to draw within the lines, right? Pull within the lines. The hardworking farmer must be first to participate in the crop. And this may appear to be like out of the middle, out of nowhere, off in space. But why does he say this? I think there is a connection. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crop. So we need to recognize those people who have paid attention to what Paul is saying here, Timothy included and allow them to live from the life they've cho chosen. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ, of the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer. So he's saying, look, Timothy, I'm telling you, you have to suffer. Remember, I did too. 
even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect. For the sake of the elect. Paul wasn't doing it for his own good. And you can all argue, well, yes, he was, because he wanted salvation. But he had already believed. He had already learned the work and the suffering that he was going to was so that others could participate, that they also might obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Yeah, important ingredient in this, in understanding how we meet our lives. God's watching us. He knows what we should be doing. He just hasn't told us exactly what you should do every day. He hasn't given you a daily planner, but he knows what you should be doing. So maybe we should be thinking, I hope I'm lining up with his plan, what he wants me to do today. Does he know that we need to go to work? Does he know we need to buy groceries? Certainly. If anybody knows it, he knows it. He knows that we need it before we need to know we need it. But we do have to think about the fact that he's observing what we're doing. That's how he's going to judge us by our work. So he remains faithful, whether we do or don't. And then I have the verses. That brings us right to the verses that we already concentrated on. Remind them of these things. Charge them before the Lord not to strive about word to no profit, to the ruin of the hearer. Right? Be diligent. Rightly divide the word of truth. So he isn't saying, Quit talking about words. He's saying, know your words. Use them correctly so there is no argument. The people that want to argue with you about it, shun. Shun profane and idle babbling. For they will increase to more ungodliness. Now, what we're going to look at now we're, we're jumping down below this text in the context, and we're going to look at what he says after this phrase, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase. They tend to grow. They have a life of their own. And their message will spread like cancer. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, I used King, New King James here. Uh, I think the old, the new, regular King James says, as does a canker, as doth a canker. Uh, the word that's it's translated from the Greek really is a word that we have translated into English, gangrenous, gangrene. Okay? It is that word in the Greek. And so to the degree that you understand what that means, you might understand this text more. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort. Oh, wait a minute. He said, avoid or shun profane and idle babbling. And then he personified that. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already passed, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from his iniquity. Back to verse 17 for just a second. Their message will spread like a canker or cancer, or gangrene, okay? This is just for those who like to be word nerds. Look at the Greek words 
in this part of this verse. Because what it really says in Greek is this, that that gangrenous will find pasture. Do you see that that's a little different meaning than, than what these others are saying? That it will spread like or eat like a painter. When it says it will find pasture, that's saying that the gangrenous thing, the babblings, the words, will find a place to eat. You see how they grow? Okay. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some of honor and some for dishonor. I hope we understand the analogy. He's, he's referring to the church here, and he says, in every great house, vessels, containers of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, and you can use your imagination. What did they use wooden and clay pots for? And what did they use gold and silver pots for? Or vessels, jars. What was the value of the ingredients put in them? What was the purpose of those vessels made of, of metals as opposed to those made of wood or clay? And he's saying every great house has various kinds of vessels and if we think of ourselves as a vessel what do we put into ourselves what are we storing what do we house what choices have we made to fill our life with therefore if anyone cleanses himself from the latter he will be a vessel for honor sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So let's turn that around. What if you don't? And the word cleanse implies that there's some, there's some dirt. There's some defilement in the wood and the clay. Okay? That would be the latter, as I would understand it, the context here. So what if you don't cleanse yourself? Are you worthy of honor? Sanctified? Have you set yourself apart? That's what sanctified means, to set apart. <clears throat> Have we done that with ourselves? And, and what does that mean, set apart? Set apart from what or whom? And yeah, I'm, I'm staying in this text today, but I think most of you can think of the text where Paul said, what we're supposed to come out from among and be separate from. Okay. So are we useful for the master? Are we prepared for every good word if we do not cleanse ourselves from being a vessel of dishonor. And he says, flee also youthful lusts. How do we find that? I think most of us kind of have an idea what it is. What did we want to do when we were young? Or younger than we are today? What is it that you know, we, we think back, take it clear back, Infants, they come out and they close their eyes and they go ah, like this and they're reaching for something and they are all about immediate feed me, something shiny comes next, right? Let me grab that and hold it, play with it, whether it's safe or not, because I can't determine, I don't know yet, but it's shiny and I want it. It's in my attention zone. Right, so we as parents have to remove things out of their attention zone that we don't want them to break or hurt themselves. With. But we move forward, and boy, we want that whatever it is. I remember I, when I saw a big wheel, 
when I was a little kid. You know, the little trike thing. Man, I wanted one of those. That just looked so cool. That, that's gone. That's a, that's a youthful lust I have fled away from. But there's, there's a lot of other things, though, as, as we just go through this process, right? For some of us, not, not so much anymore, we used to just, oh, man, we wanted our driver's license so bad. Could not wait. The day we were 16, if they were open, we were down there taking the test, right? It's just, wow, I want that. Now I'm glad to have other people drive most of the time. Um, don't like taking care of vehicles. But there's all the other things, you know, that you go, you're also at that age, you really start to realize the you know, money makes the world go around. My little world doesn't spin very fast. I don't have change, any money in my pocket, right? And uh, we just have to consider, what does he mean by, by youthful lust? We start discovering the, uh, the opposite sex. Of course, some of that's going out the window now, right? But all of that is all part of the same youthful lust. It says, but for pursue righteousness. And that, I, mean, I find it interesting, that's at the top of the list. Righteousness, wanting to be right. And I'm not talking about the guy that just wants to beat everybody in the argument right. I'm talking about the guy that truly wants to be correct, to be truthful. Faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So what category does that put us in? What neighborhood does that put us in? To have this with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now we come back to this idea about disputing. But I think we have to bring everything that we we have seen in the text that we, re, that we regard words and understanding them and rightly dividing and all that comes into this next section. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes. What's the number one way to avoid an ignorant and foolish dispute? Don't be ignorant. Don't be foolish. Isn't that the number one way to avoid it? First, to know what is right. That's not being ignorant. And be wise enough to know when to stay out of the argument. Knowing that they generate strife. <clears throat> we will not get anywhere with people who simply want to argue with us that have to be the right one in the room about things of concerning the Bible and the truths of God. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel. Now, I've had plenty of my own problems with this in the past. Being not that I was looking for a fight. I don't ever remember myself going out and wanting to argue with someone. I never did. I hated it. I always felt bad right here when it was going on, but I didn't have the wisdom to not get sucked into it. I didn't know when to stop. And I hope maybe I'm getting better at that, that I know when to say, this is going nowhere. I've seen this before. This is a mistake. Pull out peacefully. <laughs> but be gentle to all, apt to teach, and patient. So we have to be equipped. That's what apt means. Okay? Able. We have to be able to teach. So what does that require? Know the words you're going to use. Be ready to use them. But do it in patience, in humility. Even if you think you know things now, remember when you didn't. When you're talking to those who don't. In humility, and think of yourself in comparison to God. Think of your knowledge 
But your understanding in comparison to his, when you're handling his information, <laughs> in humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth, if God perhaps, He's the one that grants them repentance, not us, so that they may know the truth. Yeah, so what's that tell us? Something has to get out of the way first. In order for them to understand, something has to be removed from the way, and God does that. He does it in that we, we may say the words, but it's his words. To touch someone and make them go, oh, yeah, I was wrong. Thanks. So that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses, that they may come to their senses. We can't force that. And escape the snare of the devil. Oh, that's a big one. Do any of you recognize that you have ever been ensnared in the devil? I think we're ensnared in the devil from our infancy up. That we are trying to climb up out of our youthful lusts our entire life. Have been taken captive by him to do his will. Some versions say at his will. I'll leave you to look that up and see what you think of him. Let's close with a song. Number 237, King's Business, number 237.
loving Heavenly Father, we are truly thankful for this time together, for your words that you have given us as instruction to pleasing you. And we do pray that you will forgive us where we have failed you. We pray for all of your people, those that are here in this room today and those that are not, wherever they might be, that you would guide and protect and comfort and heal according to your will and your mercy until the day that you send Jesus back. May that day come soon. And may we hear well done. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.